Chapter 28, Hematological and Renal Emergencies. So let's first review the hematologic system. Hematology, or the blood, is the largest, or, or it's an organ in the body. It's not the largest, the skin is. <clears throat> it has functions. It stops bleeding. It protects itself from going outside of the uh, blood vessels. It transports oxygen, removes carbon dioxide, and moves all other substances around the body to all the end organs. It's made up of red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and the liquid that it's suspended in is called plasma. We can take medications or people can have other medications that have impact on what the different function of the different parts of the blood do. Uh, we can take medication like aspirin that reduces the platelet's ability to clot. Blood clotting. The platelets are kind of like the flex tape of the bloodstream. They go in there and will seal any hole or anything it perceives as a hole as soon as it happens. So the uh, proteins that influence the platelets is produced in the liver and released in the bloodstream. That helps the platelets move around to where it needs to go. Uh, when we have liver dysfunction, we can change our clotting factors. We get shot clotting factors also are changed by hypothermia. So what we want to do is make sure that we're keeping our patients warm and healthy and then they can clot when needed. Coagulopathies, abnormal clotting in the blood, deep vein thrombosis um, means it clots too easily or we can have clots that don't form at all. It forms too slowly. So we have uh, advanced liver disease, so they don't have the proteins in there, hemophilia, von Willebrand disease, all diseases that cause a decrease in clotting factors. This comes into play if we have a patient that's bleeding and they aren't clotting. So, uh, identify, Identifying patients that have coagulopathies, they don't stop bleeding. Or they're on medications that uh, prevent bleeding like Coumadin or heparin. Emergency treatment, if they are on a coagul they have coagulopathy issues, make sure you have your BSI because they will be bleeding a lot more than normal. Maintain your ABCs, get a good history, identifying if they're on blood thinners or anything, any other disorders. Tell the hospital that you're coming with a patient with these disorders because there are ways to reverse it in the hospital. Our treatment is to try to stop the bleeding with pressure and stuff. So we monitor the patient for signs and symptoms of shock, oxygen, and transport. If they're bleeding severely enough that you need a tourniquet, that's an option for you. Anemia is a lack of red blood cells in the blood. So you can have sudden acute anemia, which is like uh, blood loss. You lose the red blood cells and you uh, decrease your oxygen carrying capacity. Or they have chronic uh, anemia, recurrent heavy menstrual cycles. The, the loss of blood through a menstrual cycle uh, causes a decrease in red blood cells. Slow GI bleeds, that'll again drop the... Uh, presence of the red blood cells, and then bone marrow uh, diseases. One of those uh, diseases that causes a change in the red blood cells is sickle cell anemia, uh, most commonly occurring in uh, patients of African descent. What happens instead of a uh, donut looking shape of a red blood cell, it looks more like a sickle. That's where they get the name, sickle cell. The cells uh, die quick uh, because of this uh, poor shape. They can't uh, process their their own nutrients enough, so uh, they, they don't last very long, and that has that chronic anemia. Complications are destruction of the spleen. Because of the odd shape, as they go through the spleen, they tear up the tissue in the spleen. Uh, we can have a sickle cell crisis, which is they have a, a, a decreased... O2 saturation because uh, they don't have the uh, blood flow. Acute chest syndrome, priapism. I have an erection caused because of uh, the inability of the blood to uh, move throughout the body and it gets trapped in the penis. Strokes because the clotting factor changes. And then just regular jaundice because it's damaging the liver as it goes through. 
It's estimated that 1 in 13 African Americans has a sickle cell trait. Very few of them have sickle cell emergencies, but uh, just because they, a lot of them have the trait. Uh, if it's identified and treated properly, it doesn't become an issue long term. If you have a person with a sickle cell event, give them oxygen, make sure they're breathing good, monitor for stroke or for uh, shock, and take transport to a stroke center if they're having a stroke. The most uh, the the one service I know of that has a sickle cell EMS protocol is in D.C. Uh, the medical director for Springs Fire used to work in D.C. and he was telling us that they have that protocol in place on how to treat people with sickle cell emergencies because of the higher population there. Uh, in Colorado Springs, we really haven't had an issue with this. Uh, it could be the altitude, altitude but uh, haven't had a, a big issue with sickle cell. The renal system maintains the balance of our uh, liquids in our body. So we've got two kidneys, two ure ureters that transmit the liquids from the kidneys to the bladder, and then you one urethra, which transports it from the bladder out to the outside world. Kidneys uh, filter the blood, clean out all the extra fluid and byproducts, get rid of the salt, and then maintain that healthy balance, keeping us in homeostasis there. Some uh, kidney issues are minor. Some get up to the life-threatening because if you don't have kidneys, uh, you don't have the filtering capacity and you have long-term uh, effects of that one. So most common thing we run into are kidney infections or urinary tract infections, usually a bladder uh, infection caused by bacteria. People that are prone to bladder or uh, kidney infections or bladder infections are ones that are cathed on a frequent basis. So you have people that have difficulty urinating or live in an extended care facility, they ca put a urinary catheter in multiple times and it uh, ends up being a uh, kidney infection. Lots of pain, frequent urination, and it can actually become a, a septic issue if we don't treat it soon enough. Kidney stones, uh, made from the calcium formed in the kidneys, cause severe pain when they're trying to come out because they're a crystal. They're made of calcium crystals, and as they come out, they rip through the edges of your ure urethras, ure ureters and urethra. Um, they have nausea, vomiting, intense pain. Uh, I've heard people describe it as more painful than giving birth. If a patient has a difficulty urinating, they may put a urinary catheter in. Sometimes we run into problems with these that uh, the, they get infected or get clogs in them. So they end up going to the uh, ER. We also have uh, people that pull these out accidentally or intentionally. And there's a large inflated uh, balloon on the inside and the bladder that holds it in place. So if you pull it out, it drags that big balloon through the ureters, or urethra, causing more damage. The larger or the bigger problem, the more serious problem we have with kidneys is the renal failure. Either one or both the kidneys uh, start to lose its ability to filter and remove toxins. Uh, so this causes uh, chronic issues. Um, it could be damage from uh, trauma, it could be uh, uncontrolled or uh, irreversible trauma that causes the hypoperfusion to the kidneys. Or it could be a chronic thing, such as uh, uh, untreated uh, diabetes or hypertension. They can cause long-term kidney damage. So what we run into is called end-stage renal disease. It's irre irreversible. They have to go on some type of dialysis to replace the function of the kidneys. So they uh, have a ma machine that pulls the blood out, filters it, takes off the excess fluid and waste products, and then puts it back in. Uh, this can be either be done by hemodialysis, uh, taking it's a direct link into the venous system of the body, or the per peritoneal dialysis, where they flood the uh, gut with fluids 
and then drain it out and it does a dialysis uh, diffusion into that water as it comes out. So most of the people we're seeing are getting uh, dialysis at a hemodialysis center, uh, like DeVita is one here in town. Vast majority of more than 450,000 Americans on dialysis go to treatments three times a week for three to four hours. So they are planning their lives around dialysis. Dialysis centers are typically open 24 hours a day to accommodate all this, uh, all this traffic. If they go on vacation, they have to coordinate their vacations based on which dialysis centers has extra space that they can go in for their treatments three hours on every other day that they're on vacation. About 8% of our patients are doing this at home uh, through the peritoneal uh, dialysis. A big portion of our non-emergency transports for EMS are moving patients from their residence, wherever they live, it's, if it's a home, apartment, or a long-term care facility, to a dialysis center. Multiple times a day, multiple trips, uh, moving multiple, uh, multiple patients back and forth. Once a patient is connected to the machine, it drains the blood out, filters it, and then sends it back in. There's a diagram of what it looks like, so they will put the catheter in the vein, suck the blood out, go through a uh, pump, clean it up, and then put it back in. They typically get several liters of fluid off the patient, so if they don't do this, they start retaining that other fluid. So two types of access. You have the two-port uh, catheter. This is a temporary option. Um, the AV fistula is the more permanent one. It's implanted under the skin. Um, you will, When you feel it, it is a very wicked vibration. It's called a thrill. Um, and they leave that in there even after if they do uh, a kidney transplant. A friend of mine had a kidney transplant. Doesn't have to do dialysis anymore, but he still has the fistula in, and you can feel it, and he's, you can feel the thrill. The thrill never leaves. So there's the two-port catheter that goes in the subclavian, and that's where they do their dialysis. That is the fistula. So if you touch that, uh, the part where they're plugging the uh, catheters in, you'll feel that uh, thrill on there. Peritoneal di dialysis is when they uh, put the fluid into the gut. It absorbs the toxins and waste, and then the fluid is pulled back out through the, uh, the same catheter that goes in. Uh, it has a waste product of the, the fluid that has to be disposed of, but it keeps them from having to go back and forth to dialysis on a regular basis. So they have uh, continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. Basically, you hang the bag up, it drains in, you hang the bag low, and it drains out. So it's just uh, uh, using gravity there. Continuous cycler assist peritoneal dialysis, you have a machine that pumps it in and sucks it back out. So it's do you want to move the bag up or down, or do you have the machine where it just kind of sits there and runs while you're taking a nap? Here's what the machine or the uh, connecting port looks like. If you see a patient like this, treat them just like every other normal patient, but look for a possibility of infections on the uh, around the tubing. That's one of the more common problems we run into. Medical emergencies. Um, sometimes they have uh, the loss of the normal kidney functions. And then they have complications because the dialysis just isn't uh, uh, keeping up and they get uh, edema and uh, chronic issues there. Or they have complications during the dialysis treatment. They can have a clots, they can have uh, pulmonary embolisms, or they can uh, have severe bleeding if it becomes dislodged. Probably once or twice a day you can hear somebody get dispatched to a Dallas center for an emergency. Something's happened that uh, causes a problem while they're doing dialysis. If they miss dialysis, now that extra fluid is going to be backed up in their system. So they'll have edema, they'll have shortness of breath because of the pulmonary edema, 
and they'll have electrolyte disturbances, which create EKG disturbances or heart disturbances. So it's all kinds of problems if they're not getting their dialysis on a regular basis. If they miss dialysis, your treatment, pretty straightforward, treat them just like a CHF. Uh, you get the vital signs, put a position of comfort, oxygen, CPAP, be prepared for AED if you need, if the patient goes into cardiac arrest and transport to an appropriate facility. If they have bleeding, direct pressure, make sure you're getting good pressure on it. If you have to, go to a tourniquet because these are large ports and they will bleed a lot. So you need to stop the bleeding. The other problem they run into is a, a infection. Uh, some type of contamination of the fistula or the catheter. So those are uh, not a cr uh, acute issue that we're going to treat pre-hospital, but we need to be aware of them so we can identify that to the hospital when we go to the, take the patient in. Other, if you're treating them with a, uh, some type of complication, make sure you use, uh, get your ABC secured, control the bleeding. Um, you also use hemostatic dressings. Forgot about that one. Use a tourniquet, give them oxygen. Treat for shock. If they are, uh, if you think they've got an infection, take the fluid with you. That's something the lab can check on and see if we have issues there. Transplant, place, transplant, transplant patients. Uh, kidneys are the most common transplanted organs. They do about 12, 21,000 a year. Uh, once they get those drugs, then they have to uh, be on rejection uh, medication for the rest of their lives. They're highly susceptible to infections. And the, the weird thing that I didn't know until my friend got his transplant, they put the ki new kidney in the abdominal cavity towards the front in one of the lower quadrants. They don't put it retroperitoneal where the old kidneys were. They leave those in place and replumb it to a one in the front. Uh, so it's, it's interesting uh, to kind of see that process, but he's kind of protective of that area now because that's his only kidney up front. So, uh, any questions, document them, bring them to class, and we'll discuss them. Thanks, and have a great night.